Okay, this is part two of the history of evolution or Darwinian thinking. So let's open up my PowerPoint again. I think we're here. Uh, there we go. We're talking about some of the important hi uh, people in history that helped Darwin to develop the theory of evolution um, or the mechanism of evolution that he came up with. So um, one other researcher that's really important was um, Chevalier de Lamarck, a French naturalist, and he lived before Darwin. He examined the fossil record and he found it to be what we would call progressive, that species seem to gradually change with time. All right, so he called that, you know, the fossil record is progressive. We do see species changing over time, right? He um, concluded that evolution happens. Evolution occurs as organisms adapt to their changing environment. So I'm going to put that in there. Evolution happens. Evolution occurs as organisms uh, adapt to their changing environment. He published a book in 1809, this is the year that Darwin was actually born, and in which he publicly argued for evolution. This is, you know, one of the first people, actually I think it is the first person, to publicly argue for evolution. So, what do we know about his understanding of evolution? Well, it went something like this. Um, adaptive change happens in lineages. Um, and the adaptive change is ultimately driven by um, environmental change over time, long periods of time. In other words, organisms are going to adapt to a changing environment, but they're going to only adapt in lineages. So, for example, you know, you might have species A and the environment changes. It might change to species A prime and over time it might change to species A prime prime. Over here you might have another separate lineage B that undergoes its own evolutionary change over time. So you get these separate lineage changes. But his understanding of evolution is remarkably similar to Darwin's that uh, adaptive change happens over time. How did he figure, how did, what was the mechanism that he came up with? How can this happen? How can organisms change over time? Well, he came up with what's called the inheritance of acquired characters and the law of use and disuse. And he has been laughed at for his ideas. In recent times, Lamarckian evolution has been shown to be, to, to be true in a variety of um, examples. But let's give you the example that you're probably the most familiar with. Think about an organism like a giraffe. If you look at the fossil record, giraffes had much shorter legs and much shorter necks. And Dar uh, Darwin, <laughs> Lamarck argued that um, over time, over evolutionary time, um, giraffes began adapting and as they adapted, they acquired and um, passed along longer necks and larger legs. How did this adaptation happen? Well, it starts with a change in the environment. I'm not sure what I've got here. Ah, I'm, ah, I don't know what's going on. Nope, I'm having trouble with, uh, with my notes here. All right, it starts with uh, an altered environment that changes the needs of the organism. So if you're a giraffe and there are no more plants at a, a low height, you have to start reaching for your food, maybe stretching your legs, maybe stretching your neck. The organism changes its behavior. And this is where the law of use and disuse comes into play. And as the organism changes its behavior, the neck actually stretches a bit. The legs actually stretch a little bit. <laughs> And these acquired changes can be passed down to your offspring. That's the um, inheritance of acquired characteristics. So if a giraffe gets a slightly longer neck from stretching it while it's grabbing for, for leaves up high, then that slightly longer neck is going to be passed on to the next generation. And over multiple generations, this acquired trait can be passed along and inherited, and it can lead to a highly adapted animal, adapted for this changing environment. Well, 
That doesn't quite make sense. Nobody bought into that. Even in 1809, people were like, yeah, Lamarck, that, that does not make sense. And so his mechanism didn't quite make sense. But remember, he, he hypothesized that evolution happens and, and organisms adapt to their, environment, to, to their environment, to changes in their environment. Those are very Darwinian, all right? His mechanism didn't quite make sense, okay? So Charles Darwin arrives on the scene. He's born in 1809, lives into the 1880s, and um, he was fascinated with the natural world. His uh, parents wanted him to enter the clergy. He wasn't quite so sure. He worked um, uh, as uh, with a botanist, and he loved that. He loved chemistry and geology, and you know, all the all the hard sciences, if you will. And because um, he didn't want to go into the clergy, his dad kind of figured out they were they were wealthy. Okay. His dad figured out a way for him to go on the HMS Beagle as kind of an, um, the amateur naturalist aboard, and aboard the Beagle. And this ship was going to go all around the world and do some exploration. And while he was on this ship, he wrote dozens of notebooks um, making careful observations um, about animals and plants and geology. He also collected thousands of specimens and took them all home with him. To, to England um, five years later. And what Darwin observed was variation in species. Oh, I'm trying to get my, um, trying to get my pen to work here and I'm not sure why the pen is not working. Oh, it is working. So, uh, scratch that out. <laughs> variation in species. He observed variation in species. Let's take a look at some of the organisms that he happened to study. Okay, so you can see here, um, started in England, ended back in England again, but spent an awful lot of time in South America, where a lot of his organisms come from. And oops, remember the Galapagos Islands as well are in there, okay? But ended up traveling all the way around the world, all the way around the globe, and back to England again. What a trip, right? So... <laughs> Here's one of the examples of a species uh, of, a, of, of uh, uh, an organism that was kind of interesting to them. There are two species of South American rheas. They're ostrich-like birds, flightless birds, that live um, in South America. The greater rhea, you can see here, lives um, kind of on the south um, uh, east side of South America. They live in close close to each other, but their range doesn't really overlap. There's a greater and a lesser rhea. They're very similar in many ways, but they differed as well. The lesser rhea was smaller, um, has different coloring, has feathery legs as opposed to um, non-feathery legs, bluish uh, eggs, that's a little bit different, lives in a slightly different place. And Darwin recognize that these are clearly two different species. But they're similar, and they live close to each other. So could it be possible that these two species have originated from a single common ancestor that somehow gave rise to these two, slight, two different species? That's what Darwin is thinking. Here's another example that you're probably even more familiar with, finches in the Galapagos Islands. It turns out that there are many, many closely related species of finches that live on one of the Galapagos Islands, around several of them. There's lots of islands, and um, uh, uh, they're interesting because they're closely related. They look a lot alike, but their beak size, their beak shape, and some of their behaviors are strikingly different in the species. So here's just a couple of, um, of these uh, uh, finches that Darwin saw. A cactus eater with a particular um, beak. Ooh, look at this insect eater's beak, much more narrow. And this chunky seed eater's beak, um, beak is much broader, much tougher, right? Darwin saw that the beak size and shape and the bird behavior are specialized for specific foods that were available to the birds on different islands. So you get this specialization 
And Darwin thought about this for a minute and started to think, hmm, how could all of these closely related finches differ so much and um, differ in ways that allow them to be well adapted to their environment? And he came up with a mechanism for how these different adaptations arose. He called that mechanism natural selection. So natural selection is the mechanism he, um, he came up with. And the idea, well, we'll get to that idea. Okay, we're, we're getting there. Okay, yes, Darwin's conclusion. After seeing these kinds of um, closely related but different organisms across the globe in different ways, Darwin came up with this idea of descent with modification. He called, um, he really didn't talk about evolution. He, he used the term descent with modification, and he said, it seems like that happens. One ancestral species can give rise to many new forms that are locally adapted to their environment. A new species can gradually arise, that's that gradualism idea, as um, organisms, uh, as adaptations accumulate in different environments. So you start with one ancestral species that may give rise, that may be, you know, one ancestral finch that lived in the Galapagos Islands. But over time, these finches on different islands were exposed to uh, different environmental conditions, different food availabilities. And that could lead to a gradual change in these organisms over time. And so we get a bird with a slightly bigger beak. And then that slightly bigger beak, it diverges even farther, okay, into a variety of organisms, okay? Over time, one ancestral species, one ancestor down here, gives rise to many new species that are adapted to their environment. That's the idea of evolution, descent with modification. The question is, I mean, Lamarck came up with the same idea, you know, 50 years earlier. The question is, how? Now, Darwin's idea of descent with modification was mostly accepted by scientists of this time. This wasn't really a question. Evolution wasn't really a problem. He came up with the idea, um, oh, here's another slide, of how that descent with modification happens. We can see this in our um, example here of a phylogeny of elephants and their relatives and um, the branching pattern that you see as organisms diverge from each other. But we start with a single ancestor that gives rise to all of these different types of organisms. Some of them are no longer alive, so this is the line of the present. Um, anything that doesn't make it that far, like the mammoths, didn't quite make it that far, right? Um, oh, look at that. Manatees are relatives of this and I mean, are, are connected to our uh, elephants. But the next question is, what is the mechanism of evolution? Can Darwin come up with an explanation for how organisms can adapt to these new and changing environments? He does. He comes up with a mechanism that he calls natural selection as the mechanism by which populations of individuals evolve and become better adapted. What is natural selection? We're going to spend the next lecture on um, on the mechanisms of evolution, and one of those big mechanisms is natural selection. But probably you've heard the phrase, oh, of course, it's the survival of the fittest. That's what natural selection means. That phrase is not a favorite among biologists. I mean, it's a shortcut. It kind of, natural selection kind of is the survival of the fittest, but we want to define it with a little more clarity um, as we move into the next lecture. In 1859, Darwin, remember he went around the world in the 1830s. He spent a lot of time when he got back um, coming up with his mechanism of evolution and providing support or evidence for it. And he finally published the book, The Origin of Species, in 1859 when he was going to get scooped by his cousin or nephew, I can't remember, um, Wallace. Uh, who had some of the same ideas. So then he finally rushed his publication out of The Origin of Species. And so we're going to take a look at that mechanism of evolution, natural selection, and other mechanisms of evolution in the future. This is just kind of a funny, uh, a, a funny line. Um, 
and we'll move on later. Thanks. Let me get out of here and call it good.